Hello and welcome to the big picture. The G20 meeting which concluded in Sydney yesterday has raised several important issues crucial to the emerging economies. The key focus of the meeting was to increase the global growth by at least two percentage points over the next five years. Meanwhile, the meeting has expressed concern over the delay in implementing the IMF quota as well as governance reforms. The attitude of the United States is a key factor to these reforms and the communique made it evident too. The Indian Finance Minister P. Chidambaram who attended the meeting with the RBI Governor Raghuram Rajan has expressed concern over the impact of US tapering, especially on the emerging economies. He also laid emphasis on the reforms of the IMF. We will discuss all this today and see whether the targets set by the Sydney meet are achievable and what are the hurdles facing them and the impact of all this on India. To discuss this, I have with me Mohan Guruswamy, Economist and Chairman Centre for Policy Alternatives, Renu Kohli, former staff member at the RBI and the International Monetary Fund, Nirodpal Basu, Central Committee Member, CPIM, and Professor N. R. Banumurthy, Member, National Institute for Public Finance and Policy. Welcome to all of you. Renu, I would like to come to you first. These targets which, has, which have been set in this meeting uh, in Sydney, about 2%, 2.5% 2 growth, global growth, GDP growth rate by 2018 in the next five years. You think it's an achievable target? You think the, the, the global situation would allow such that kind of a growth? Yeah, these targets are conditioned upon a set of uh, structural reforms that the IMF has advocated. Um, IMF's own projections for uh, this year and the next year are 3.8 and to 3.9 percent glo of global growth. Now, what happens is that uh, the reforms range from you know fiscal uh, fiscal consolidation down to you know supply side reforms, and uh, each country has to decide for itself. Some of the reforms countries are doing anyway, for example, fiscal consolidation, right. India is already undertaking that. But supply side reforms are quite difficult and uh, no country, even though they may commit to them as a group, it remains to be seen whether it will be done. Regardless of that, still the uh, percentage point gain that the IMF's projections show from 3.8 to 3.9 this year, if you add 0.5% each year, it lifts up global growth to about 4.5%. Um, two or three percent, uh, percent each year. Um, I'm not very optimistic because supply side reforms are politically difficult all over the world. Okay, uh, Banamurthy, would you agree with that that it, it, it's a difficult target which it has set for itself? Uh, we will come to the reforms aspect of it, the IMF aspect, of it, but what the, the targets which have been set? You well, uh, this is the first time G20 started uh, fixing, you know, quantitative kind targets. of uh, targets. Um, my view is that, you know, the kind of success G20 had in the past, um, as Renu has rightly pointed out, to bring in some of the structural or supply side reforms uh, within the G20 uh, seems to be, I think, uh, a little more difficult. In fact, in their own terms, it says that it is going to be more ambitious. Yes. But at the same time, the realistic policies would help in They're talking achieving of zero point four percent. Uh, growth every year, which, right. which should, you know, they should achieve this 2%. Yeah, this is above the base. Yes. The base itself is slightly higher, the IMF projections seems to be base itself is slightly higher than what uh, going to be realistic. So, in a sense, 0.4% uh, above the base level line is going to, it needs much more policy reforms and it is not going to happen in one year and two years time. So, that is why it is going to be for the next five year period, almost to say that it's a planned period kind of situation. Yeah. yeah. Mohan, Mohan you, how do you see the U.S. role there? If you see the communique we showed yesterday, there is a lot of emphasis on what the U.S. does which will have repercussions on them. Interestingly, the IMF, uh, IMF managing director says that, you know, the emerging economies keep uh, complaining about the uh, U.S. and things like that. You should stop complaining. But U.S. will play a key role in this. And are they interested in playing a key role? <clears throat> there are two very different things out here. IMF has an institution. The G7 effectively controls the IMF. Right. So the G7 has an institution. The G20 is not an institution. The G20 is just a forum. Is, you know, is a gathering. Is a gathering which comes twice a year. 
and goes. It's something new. The G70, G20 accounts for almost 85% of global GDP. Uh, and the G7 is becoming a smaller part of the G20 because in the last five years what's happened is uh, the number two and number three places in world GDP rankings have gone to countries which are not in the G7, mm -hmm. China and India. You know? So these are new factors coming into play out here. So there is a subtle power shift taking place. I think G20 has not institutionalized itself as yet. And after the last G20 meeting in St. Petersburg, I think, uh, the Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, who's uh, a well-known economist, as you know, uh, he said that we must institutionalize the G20 right. and offered to locate a secretariat in Delhi. Right. And very interestingly enough, his Minister for Urban Development rejected it, saying that I don't have a place to offer. <laughs> but if you had a secretariat, in, in Delhi, then you would have begun the institutionalization of G20. Which and and, 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 and develop some kind of a cloud in that. In and develop some kind of a cloud and say, because you need economists, you need researchers to be working right. and you know, churning out papers and you know evolving positions. But <clears throat> in our short thinking, you know, some bureaucrats said we can't, we don't have a spare building, so we won't have them here. So I think we have lost a great historic opportunity. But if there's a G20, the G20 can drain in the U.S. If you look at, analyze the current world problems dispassionately, it's U.S. profligacy, an unabated U.S. printing of, of, of dollars, unabated credit to its own people, and living on other people's money, which has caused this situation. Right. And you know, we're all hooked to it. You know, we are, the U.S. is like the great um, uh, drug addict, and we've all become the drug peddlers <laughs> to, to feed its appetite. You know, and it all it does is print more notes and give it to us. Right. So this system, people like Rubini and all said, this is not going. To, it's a natural system. Even Soros has been saying that that this is not going to last for long. We need substantial restructuring of how the world runs its economies, and as long as the U.S. is the sole benefactor of this system, it's as if on one island, we're all living in only one fellow prints notes, and all of us supply goods yes. in exchange for those notes. The sole benefactor of this. There will be no incentive to change. So therefore, you need a parallel institution to start moving into this area. Parallel institution. Nilotpal, Nilotpal when you look at the world, uh, you know, in, international financial order, you, know, you people have been talking about, uh, uh, you know, the IMF and World Bank and, the, and, the, and their policies and things like that. But as Mohan says, do you think G20 could emerge as some, some kind of a... Uh, mechanism which can control the U.S.? I think difficult because, you see, ultimately uh, it's political economy and uh, people tend to make these observations that uh, don't mix economics and politics, but uh, there can be no pure economics. And uh, the whole financial architecture today uh, is there because of the overarching presence of the empire and the way uh, it really uh, creates an environment for that to operate. Therefore, uh, United States uh, and the international finance capital, uh, they got away with the financial meltdown on the factors which uh, uh, went into the staging of the financial meltdown. And still, after that, you see the way they tried to bail out their own economy or rather uh, bail out their own financial oligarchies and all that. And, uh, that has impacted. And even somebody uh, like Chidambaram, who is uh, otherwise uh, so enamored by whatever happens in uh, Washington, uh, has to say that uh, very mildly that uh, whatever you are doing, it is impacting us. I think uh, given by the communique that I read of this meeting, uh, the outlook does not uh, really look very uh, rosy and, and uh, in fact they themselves have uh, expressed in between the lines doubts about the uh, final uh, uh, realization of the targets that they have set for themselves. And so far as the G20 is concerned, I think uh, G20 uh, was a mechanism which was thought out by the G7 itself because they had uh, messed up the global economy so much so uh, that they thought that it is becoming a dangerous game. Therefore, 
let us uh, rope in uh, uh, people who were outside the G7 uh, to, to uh, really, uh, as they say, uh, broaden uh, the risk and all that. And uh, that is why they uh, have, have done this. But on, on key issues like uh, uh, structural changes in the governance structure and weightage of the IMF, they are not moving anywhere. We are not moving anywhere. And Reno Kohli, one of the one of the important issues which came up during the meeting was the was the delay in implementing uh, you know these quota reforms, which was August January two thousand fourteen was the deadline sent in January in two thousand ten. But you know the, there was a lot of disappointment over that not having been achieved. You think that the present uh, deadline, new deadline, which they have given to, for themselves, April, they they expect US to you know, come out with their, uh, with something by, the, by that time. Do you think that is again a, a reasonable expectation or you think the U.S. will not be able to uh, again, you know, keep up to the deadline and the impact of not having this? It is uh, very much dependent upon uh, the U.S. Congress uh, clearing it and agreeing to this. Um, in the past two years in the U.S., uh, domestic politics has been very, very fractious and in fact it affected their own uh, raising of their debt ceilings and so on, affecting their own e economy as well. So, but of late in the last two months there have been, uh, uh, there has been a move of a more amicable kind of uh, 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 cons uh, uh, politics uh, in the U.S. So let's hope uh, for the best. Um, there isn't uh, much support uh, within the U.S., I think, or within the Congress for that matter. I have been through some of the Congress, uh, Congress office reports and uh, it is linked to how much uh, funding can be obtained, alternative funding, etc. And uh, it, um, it's very iffy, I would say. Okay. Balamurthy? Well, uh, uh, how uh, far is it important now that we know? This IMF reforms, the quota reforms especially, it's completely dependent on the U.S. now. Right. Right? Right. No, I think uh, this is a continuous process. Um, this has been, I mean, I think the G20 has already taken up this issue and there could be delay and we know very well how if you want to change the international governance system, it takes its own time. But more important uh, for us at the moment from this communique is, uh, one is about the growth the kind of policies that you need to really get to that growth, if not close to, I mean, uh, uh, almost close to that growth, at least near to that. Right. But more important is the kind of tax policies exactly. that G20 is really highlighting. I think uh, we need to really concentrate more on those tax mechanism, how, what kind of cooperation uh, there could be among the G20 nations in terms of the tax policies, particularly the transfer pricing policies, yes. which I think more important than than uh, reforming the IMF, IMF system. And, you know, the, one of the things why there is so much talk of reforming this or you know this IMF quota. Disagree with that. Uh, you disagree with that? Okay, Reno, you disagree with that? Yes, uh, because uh, if you see, yes, I strongly disagree. I, which is not to say that tax uh, harmonisation across uh, countries isn't important. It is a very important issue, no doubt. Right. But that does not really, I think, uh, undermine or uh, place less emphasis on uh, reform of the international uh, financial architecture. And in fact, if I, we were to see the uh, trace the trajectory or the evolution of G20's coordination in this regard, you can see there is a branching out. The BRICS uh, countries have at some stage have had to, you know, set up their own BRICS bank for development right. um, um, uh, financing of uh, uh, infrastructure in respective countries. More important than that, at the St. Petersburg summit uh, in uh, November last year, they announced the setting up of a $100 billion bailout fund right. just in order to protect themselves right. from the onslaught of uh, financial market, market volatility. So it is a serious issue and it directly is linked to the problem of uh, the dollar being a reserve currency. Absolutely. Now, the, the issue is somewhat like this. Just as no other country can tell India what to do and how to run its monetary policy, 
Other countries too cannot tell the U.S. as to how it should be running its monetary policy. The problem arises because its currency also happens to be the reserve currency. So you have to find an alternate solution. Now to find an Alter alternate yes. solution, all countries have to agree. The, originally the global interest, the watchdog was to be the IMF, but the IMF is cannot guard global interests simply because of its governance structure. Absolutely. So, you know, it's like a chicken and egg problem. You have to square one. I, I, yes, yes, quickly. Well, I, I think I uh, IMF governance reforms is, uh, I, I'm not saying it's not a priority. Uh, we all under, agreed that G20 cannot deliver on many aspects. We are only looking for a low-hanging fruit, <laughs> which the G20 can achieve. Can, I, can achieve. So I think and you that think is that, the, that this tax avoidance mechanism... I mean, that is the small is. point I've been trying to say. Okay. Yeah. As one. <coughs> You know, uh, the uh, okay. IMF is totally under U.S. control and Europe's control. So, you know, the IMF would never tell the U.S. that your deficits are out of line. No, in, or, fact, you know, in fact, the, in fact, it's very told them. No, no, in fact, it's very interesting that the IMF uh, managing director, uh, she, has, but she has said that emerging economies should not blame the U.S. for their market yeah, turbulence. Yeah, yeah, but you know. And, uh, you know but, but she's but, very clear that you know emerging economy. The, but our, our finance minister has made it clear that you know the when U.S. No, no, I'm, I'm responding tapering. to a, I'm responding to a point which Renu Kohli made. Yes. Renu Kohli says that just as we don't like others to meddle around with our internal affairs, right? The U.S. does not like, yeah, exactly. but the U.S. does meddle with our internal affairs through the not IMF, just as through the through the IMF. But the IMF keeps red flagging things, keep telling you things. They're hectoring you all the time, you know. And I think the IMF has failed in its duty to tell that to the United in States. In case, we never you, take an IMF yeah, seriously. Yeah. Okay, but, you know, the point is that, you know, when things go bad, IMF imposes conditionality. They even impose conditionality on, say, Britain right. in, in, in the 70s. But the U.S. is in just that di dire straits, except that, you know, very nearly its currency was not intended to be the global reserve. It, in Bretton Woods, it didn't agree to... Um, the uh, uh, special, you know, the, the new ca Cancor currency, which Keynes had, had, had recommended. And so, willingly, it became the preferred currency of the world. It says that 65% of our reserves are in, in dollars. But there's still 35%, and that is changing. Now, you see, the BRICS bank is the first step. In By 2035, BRICS will be become big, bigger than G7. Hopefully. You know, internally, Hopefully. also, the change is taking place. Hope. So, I think, I think this transition, U.S. is going to resist every bit to uh, allow its primacy to continue over the IMF, whereas it will be challenged by other countries, rising economies, who challenge it. Nilodpal, Nilodpal, the question of, you know, the IMF reform, Gota reforms, governance reforms, all these things we have discussed. But the issue is that now that the, the tapering, the U.S. tapering has begun, and the finance minister, though so far India is supposed to have handled it pretty well and you know it has not got affected as much as other countries have got affected, still the finance minister is still very, very concerned about the impact of it. You think that his concerns and the concerns of the emerging economies will be taken into consideration by the US at all? You see the irony is uh, that uh, India was a little less affected because of the um, points that we had made at that point in time that uh, we cannot go whole hog and we need to certain uh, take certain protective measures i mean uh, uh, don't go uh, for full uh, uh, liberalization of of uh, the the uh, capital account uh, and and don't merge uh, indian currencies because you see the biggest asymmetry of today's global uh, economic and financial architecture is that one country uh, is holding the key through the dollar hegemony right. and therefore uh, I think that is the biggest problem that uh, Renuji while she is saying that we cannot meddle with uh, US economy but uh, they are uh, uh, I mean uh, by, by, by default uh, I mean they are only potent in our economies by whatever happens to dollar and the man, uh, manner in which they manage their economy. So it is, uh, you see, it is a win-win uh, situation for the U.S. Therefore, unless the IMF gets uh, uh, democratized, the, the, there is uh, uh, reforms. Uh, you see, uh, whatever we may say, Indian economy will be uh, affected. So I think uh, the future 
with the kind of multipolarity that is emerging, as Mohan was also mentioning, in the global economy, I think uh, that the, really the resolution will remain not in uh, uh, within the uh, 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 framework of I IMF or uh, G7 or G20, but by rival structures, not just parallel structures, but rival structures like BRICS and uh, all that uh, really getting consolidated. Reno, you think these rival structures will be allowed to grow and uh, you know, consolidate by the US? Uh, after all, it is it's going to affect them also. So, you think that the US will sit and wait and and watch the rival structures developing and you know strengthening i i, I don't think uh, it has any choice because you see these structures are very much represent the you know contribution of these countries to global uh, gdp which is about 60% already if i'm not mistaken it is also determined by the usage of their currency. The more they trade, the more their currencies uh, become invoicing uh, currencies. And then financial markets build up upon that, upon trade volumes and trade-related uh, transactions. So I don't think there is uh, any choice. There is also the issue that, uh, you know, whether there can be actually international monetary cooperation or macroeconomic coordination. Um, uh, the chairman, the, the president the, of the ECB the said sometime last year talks about it. that the true uh, he said that uh, it talks about it, but you know, uh, all, all the leaders are gathered there. It is something which has been brought about, and post crisis actually, it um, it it helped out a little bit here and there. But I think the true test would be that would any country, as Mario Draghi said last year, that the true test of a coordination is that would any country run a policy that it would not do otherwise in okay. its own national interest. Yes. And I think post-2008 crisis, each country did what it had to, it helped its own country. Absolutely. So that's the true test and we, we, we cannot see that. And uh, even the formation of the BRICS group, it may act as a counterweight to the pact of non-aggression that the developed countries have vis -vis amongst themselves at institutions like the IMF. And in that, to that extent, I think it will be very helpful as a counterweight. Okay. But not otherwise in terms of, you know, just coordinating with each other and all the same factors would play. Okay. I think, I think there's a basic conflict of interest out here. In the short run, we're all interested in stability right. of the markets and everything so that, you know, we can go about our business as we know it. Yes. But we know that this system is unequal and not desirable right. in the long run. So we've got to make this transition without rocking the boat. And as long as the U.S. is there, it will not want, to, want this transition or delay this transition as, much as, as, as much as possible. And that is something, it, this is not the only transition here. There's a power shift taking place. How long can the P5 remain the P5? You know, directing the world what to do. You know, all these things have to change completely. The international arrangements of power and, and economics have to change. So I think there's a gradual process which has begun. You know, already countries like Brazil and China trade in each other's currencies. Chinese have offered the same arrangement with, with India that we buy and sell in, 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 in rupees and, and yuan. Right. Uh, we used to have this with Russia at one time. So I think if Many of these countries do direct trade, and as their own trade is rising, hmm. the importance of the U.S. market will diminish. Right now, the U.S. market is very important to us because all of us depend and on that U.S. trade deficit. And it will to continue to growth. be important for quite some time to come. Well, maybe the next 10, 15 years, yes. God knows for how long, till there is a crash in the U.S. again, <laughs> which many people are predicting. Yes. You know, it's so unbalanced and skewed with toxic loans and bad <laughs> loans, credit card debt itself goes to about you know several hundred billion dollars right so you know any time that could come unraveling down i think <coughs> the new bilateral arrangements are taking place might be one way to obviate it but i think we have to do this over the next few decades not something like you know there is a collapse tomorrow and then day after tomorrow we all sit together on the debris and then start working <laughs> out a new plan uh, banamurthy the us you know the the concern expressed by the finance minister saying that you know this he said a very interesting thing there. He said that when, when the global crisis happened, financial crisis happened, 
the IMF, you know, advised the emerging economies that, you know, please help us, cooperate with us and things like right. that. We right. did. And then now that when that the economy is slightly showing some recovery, that they should help us. Right. You, you think this, this um, you know, plea or whatever uh, we would like to call it of the finance minister would be heard at all? Yeah, I think if you look at this communique, I think there are some of the concerns that uh, both finance minister expressed, even the secretary DEA expressed even before he went to Australia in terms of looking for some kind of guidance right. in the U.S. monetary policy. I think they have been addressed. If you look at, there are two C's here. One is that carefully calibrated monetary policy right. and also clearly communicated monetary policy. I think this is something which they are trying to hit on the U.S. monetary policy. And even the Fed chairman has agreed that uh, there would be some kind of uh, information sharing between central bankers before they go for uh, monetary policy. I think uh, our RBA governor also said the same thing. Before you go for any action, you keep the emerging market economies in confidence. Right. So that will help the markets to, I mean, to maintain some kind of stability. I think if, if you look at the post-May 2013, uh, all these decisions, if you look at, uh, did help to some extent uh, not to really destabilize the emerging market financial sectors. Yes, I, I, think, I think the biggest threat the world faces right now is this rapid flows of currency. Huge amounts of currency, Absolutely. money comes in and goes out, it's swashing around and it destabilizes balances, you know. And I think there is time for some institution like the G20 to consider imposition of a Tobin tax, you know, each time money comes in, you tax it, each time it goes, you tax it, to slow down this velocity. And many financiers in the world, people like George Soros are recommending this for a long time. But, you know, this, this merchant bank consensus, you know, all these lounge lizards who sit in five-star <laughs> hotels, their consensus is that this money should keep, should keep well, plotting really? enough, should, because they make money on the way in and on the way out. Right. You know? and so I think that has to end. Milot Pal, very quickly, last words to you. You think uh, you think that the, the this U.S. tapering, you know, will uh, will affect us because Chidambaram says that you know there is there is a lot of uh, flight of capital now from the emerging economies. What is the solution to it? Asking uh, you know, pleading with the United States, is it going to help at all? Uh, it, it it was bound to happen. You see, if you look at our current account deficit, I mean, uh, the current account deficit has uh, actually mounted because of the liberalization of the uh, credit by Indian private corporates in a very big way. And uh, I think in the budget also, Mr. But, Chidambaram but, uh, is, is actually now trying to uh, shift the emphasis away. So what Mohan was saying, uh, it was music to my ears yeah, because this for a change. Tax for a change, kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, you have to you have to step in to really uh, uh, monitor and and regulate the the hot money flow. Okay, I think on that note we need to end. Uh, interesting discussion we'll wait and see how how these things will emerge brisbane in november the, uh, the g20 will be meeting there and there we will see some more movements hopefully thanks to all my guests renu kohli nilotpal basu mohan guruswami and barumurthy please keep watching we'll come back with another issue in big picture same time tomorrow